By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today it is Tuesday and that means more magic for you from the Raging Bull series, the old school magic tournament of Amsterdam. And we have reached the semi-finals. Now, if you've missed any of the other games and maybe you would like to check them out before enjoying this semi-final match, check the description below because there you will find a link to the uh, to the playlist with all the videos that, uh, that I've made so far of these Raging Bull series going all the way back to the Swiss rounds. But now we have reached the semi-finals and in the semi-finals we're going to look at uh, two well-known decks, uh, Wouter Boendemaker, the player on the top, he's playing with a mono red Atok, and he's gonna play against Bjorn, and Bjorn is playing with a blue, red, black robots deck. So both of these decks are very well known, so it's no surprise to me that I'm finding these here in the semifinals. Now, before we go into these decks and take a closer look at them, I would just like to point out that uh, if you want more information about this tournament, for example, the rule set of this tournament, we're playing Swedish, uh, then you can check the description below and there you will find a link explaining the rule set, a link to the Raging Bull website and you know all other information that maybe you want to know. Uh, there's also a really nice tournament report on RagingBullSeries.com um, written by the organizer Richard so you can find it there. And um, also what you can find there are the timestamps. So if you wanna go, for example, straight to the matches, if you wanna skip the deck deck section, you can find a timestamp that reads MTG Games. Just click on there and that will take you straight to the games. You can also find timestamps to the specific deck decks of the decks of Wouter and Bjorn. Talking about the deck decks, let's take a look at the deck of Bjorn. And here we see the deck of Bjorn. So it's blue, it's red, and there's a little bit of black, and it's a robots deck. And it's called a robots deck because of all the artifact creatures, the four Sushis, the four Triskelions, the two Tetravuses in this deck. So there are just a lot of robots. And these robots are really, really important for Bjorn. You know, he wants to use his, you know, his Moxen, um, his Mishra's Workshop, and all his other mana ramp to kind of deploy these big, bad robots as early as possible, and then preferably copy them with his four copy artifacts that are here in this deck. And especially Triskelions will be a force to be reckoned with. You know, it's six to cast for a 4-4. Four four. That may not sound very strong, but they come into play as a 1-1 one one and they have three plus one plus one counters on them. And you can remove a counter to deal one damage to any target. And you can just do a lot of, a lot of things with the trike. You know, as soon as the trike hits, you're, you're able to copy it. Then you already have six damage direct damage on the board, which is quite a lot. And there are also three uh, Sages of Latinams in this deck, and I think they're gonna be uh, playing an important role. Sage of Latinam, one blue and one to cast for a one-two creature from the Antiquities expansion. And you can tap the Sage of Latinam, sacrifice an artifact to draw a card. And this is specifically good when you use it in combination with the trike, right? You play the trike, you do some attacking, you, re you use the counters to remove a creature of your opponent or to deal some direct damage. Then you sack the trike to the Sage of Latinam, you get to draw a card. And you know what? If you're lucky, you even get to play an animate dead. And hey, guess who's back? The Triskelion. And another neat little synergy in this deck, by the way, is the Tetravus that works really well with the Sage of Latinam because Tetravus, also a 1-1 one, one creature for six, a 1-1 one, one flyer, comes into play with three plus one plus one counters, so basically a 4-4 four, four flyer. And in your upkeep, you can take the counters off and turn them into little 1-1 one, one flyers. They're called Tetravites. So those little 1-1 one, one flyers, of course, you can also sacrifice to the Sage to draw a card. So you can kind of trade those plus one plus one counters on the Tetravus four cards when you have a Sage of Latinam next to it on the board. Now, besides these very strong robot tricks, the rest of the deck is just, you know, your usual power level, right? We're seeing all the power here. The full power nine is represented in this deck. We also see a single Icy Manipulator. We see two Mana Volts, of course, used to ramp up as quickly as possible. And then again, in an ideal scenario, Bjorn will be able to sack the tap Mana Volts to the Sage of Latinam and even draw a card out of it. I mean, how much value is that? We also see some of the uh, restricted cards, the, uh, the usual ones, right? Demonic Tutor, Mind Twist, Mana Drain, Wheel of Fortune, Brain Geyser, and then there's also that single Fireball there in the left top corner, just in case when you need those those last points, you know, those last points of damage, you just have your 
handy fireball to deal direct damage and don't underestimate a single fireball in the deck because Bjorn is also playing with Demonic Tutor. So that means that you're basically playing with two of everything, you know, and Demonic Tutor in this deck, I think it's extremely strong because there are so many uh, good cards. I mean, Demonic Tutor Ancestral Recall, of course, is usually the go-to play, but there's way more in this deck than just to go for that Ancestral Recall. So this is the deck of Buren. It's looking very, very strong. I'm not surprised this has made it all the way to the, to the semifinals today. And I wouldn't be surprised if this deck will make it to the actual finals. But um, don't underestimate his opponent though, because I had a look at the deck of Wouter. Woo, it is feisty. Now let's take a look at Wouter's Atox. And here we see the deck of Wouter. And as you can see, this is an Atoc build, right? This, this is as Atoc as they get. Um, the first thing actually I noticed besides the four Atox is the fact that it has no power. So this is an underpowered deck, but don't let that fool you. It doesn't mean this is not a powerful deck. And this is a nice um, piece of proof that, you know, power will get you a long way. And yes, it will improve most decks, but you can also get into semifinals and finals of tournaments without power. Uh, but what you have to do is you have to build usually pretty aggressive decks. And this is definitely an aggressive deck. We see uh, four Atox there. And actually talking about power, the Mishra's Workshop officially is not power, but it is, for me, it's definitely a power card, right? It's it's so extremely good. You tap it, you get three mana to cast artifacts. Just, just insane value. And in a deck like this, it's gonna work really well. So um, what does Wouter want to do? Well, I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with the Atok strategy, right? Atok, one red and one to cast for a one, two creature from the antiquities. You can sacrifice an artifact to give it plus two, plus two. And that is what makes this creature so difficult to deal with because it's just a one, two. So, you know, Wouter attacks with it and you're like, okay, it's just a one, two. Maybe I can block it. Wait a minute. If I block it, he could sacrifice one of his artifacts or maybe two or maybe three and he could kill my blocker. But if I don't block it, he could sacrifice a lot. He could deal a lot of damage and then playing against red. Oh, wait a minute. What is red really good at? Exactly. Direct damage. And we're seeing that in this deck as well for uh, lightning bolts three chains, right? Uh, two disintegrates. We also see a fork in this deck. So there's just a lot of direct damage power and combine the direct damage power in combination with also the four Triskelions that we see in this deck because a Triskelion is basically an expensive lightning bolt plus kind of a mini giant growth for an Atok. I mean, this deck is just really risky to play against and before you know it, you'll be dead, you know? And, and I also like some of the um, traditional combos that we see in this deck. For example, the Black Vice and the Ankh of Mishra. Now, this is something that, you know, people have been playing for 25 years. You know, you play a Black Vice, right? And Black Vice deals one point of damage to, uh, to your opponent for each card that he or she has above four in hand. So what do you want to do when you are facing a Black Vice? You want to play out your cards. But then wait a minute, you're also deploying an Ankh of Mishra. And Ankh of Mishra means for every land that's being played out, you take two damage. So all of a sudden, you want to play out land so you can play out cards, so you can empty your hand, but you don't want to do it because the Ankh of Mishra is going to punish you for it. But if you don't do it, the Black Vice will punish you for not playing out anything. So that's kind of that catch-22 that this deck can do. And you're probably thinking, okay, but you're starting with 20 life. You can take some hits. That is true. But the problem with these aggressive decks is before you know it, you're around the 10 mark and then the direct damage starts creeping up on you. You know, then all of a sudden the lightning bolts, the chains, the disintegrates. And when you're low enough, are you willing to take that other hit from the ATOC or, or are you kind of forced to make that, um, that bad block just because you cannot take any more damage from the ATOC because it could possibly sacrifice his Mana Vault, his Felwer Stone, his, you know, his Ankh of Mishra. And after that, he can cast a land without taking damage. So... This is, this is I, when I'm looking at this deck, and, and, I, and I know this from experience as well, this is one of those decks that before you know it, you're, you're under pressure. You're under pressure almost from the start of the game, and that makes it really difficult to play. I do think that uh, Bjorn has the tools to play underneath it, you know, because he's got the power cards, and power cards are typically cards that can get you back, you know. If you're under pressure, a power card can kind of change it, because all of a sudden you get an extra turn. All of a sudden you get extra three cards, you know. All of a sudden you get to pick a whole new hand. So power cards are definitely a way to to get out under the the pressure of this deck, but it's going to be tough. And I wouldn't be surprised if actually Wouter will make it to the finals with this list, because this is a very solid, very aggressive, and very strong old school magic ATOC deck. 
Okay, so this is it. We've looked at the deck of Bjorn. This is the deck of Wouter. Now let's go to the semifinals. Game number one here at the semifinals of the Raging Bull series. Best of three. Who's gonna advance to the finals? Wouter at the top or Bjorn at the bottom? So Bjorn playing robots. He's on the play here, starting with a Mishra's Factory Mox Pearl into a Soul Ring. Pretty solid start for Bjorn. What can Wouter do? Just playing a single mountain passing turn here. There is a Mishra's Workshop tapping for six. Boom! Tetravas turn two. That is a pretty good start for Bjorn here. Oh man, if you're Wouter, you must be, uh, be getting uh, worried. Can he do anything? Playing a second mountain, and yes he can. Chain Lightning, Lightning Bolt, taking care of the Tetravis being blown out of the sky. But it is costing Wouter two cards. Let's see if Bjorn has another threat in hand. Looks like he doesn't. Animating his factory, attacking for two here. Wouter going down to 18, playing a Mox Ruby. So really drawing into the mana sources, but I think the problem for Bjorn here is that he also needs to find some threats. And there we see Wouter playing a Vice. Don't think that will play a big role in this matchup because Bjorn's hand is already down to three at the moment. Another Mox, by the way, passing turn here. Another Mountain for Wouter. And ooh, that's a Rook Egg, the O3 creature from uh, Arabian Nights. And there we see Bjorn responding in the end step, playing an Ancestral Recall. That does mean that he's gets, he gets some damage from the Vice 1, to be precise. Going down to 19, playing a City of Brass. I wonder if he can find any threats. But that Rook Egg could be quite annoying for Bjorn, actually, because Bjorn's playing with a lot of ground forces. For example, um, you know, Suchi strikes, stuff like that. Okay, tapping 5 here. There is a Suchi 4-4 creature from the Antiquities and playing an Animate Dead on the, on the Tetravis. That is actually pretty nice. So the Tetravis is now a 3-4 flyer because Animate get Dead gives minus 1, minus 0 to the creature. And he can fly over the Rook Egg. And there we see a Suchi from Wouter. So both players having a Suchi in play. And Bjorn here taking off the counters, making them into 1-1 one, one flyers, into Tetravites. So having 3 1-1 one, one Tetravites, they do have Summoning Sickness. So he cannot attack with them yet. We'll have to be patient. Still not taking any damage from the Vice. Both players having three cards in hand. You can see that by the dice that they're using. So Bjorn has that red dice. And uh, Wouter has the black one over there. Both on three. And let's see. So Wouter looking, deciding what to do. Attacking now with the Suchi. I wonder if Bjorn wants to trade and actually he's blocking it with the Tetravis, which is not too bad because if you're Bjorn and you're drawing into another anime debt, you can just get it back. So makes sense this move. There is a Triskelion. Bjorn can now of course attack with the three flyers. And uh, is he doing it or not? I believe he's actually not doing that. It's kind of unclear at the moment. I think it's still Bjorn's turn here. Trying to decide what to do. Or actually it's Wouter's turn. Okay, Wouter attacking here kind of missed that passive turn, but he's attacking with the 4-4. And he's blocking now on the Suchi. So they're trading off. And I think that's uh, that's a sensible trade for Bjorn here. And now let's see. What else Wouter can do? I mean, things are looking kind of good for Bjorn. He can just attack with his Air Force. Kind of start dealing damage to uh, to Wouter. Tapping a red, bolting his own Rook Egg. That means he's going to get a 4-4 Bird Token. So 4-4 Flyer here. That changes the scenario. And I now wonder if Bjorn is going to attack with his Triskelion. Kind of giving a trade option. Okay, tapping... Five, Fireball for four. Okay, that is good news for uh, for Bjorn here. There's a fork, forking the Fireball. Oh, that's cool. And is he now going to fork? Oh, Mana Drain. I was wondering what he was going to target, if he was going to target the Trike. But um, okay, there's the Mana Drain. So that's good business here for Bjorn, having the answers right now, being able to attack. So he's attacking for three. Interestingly enough, he's not attacking with the uh, Triskelion. And there is a Suchi, so 
choosing to keep the trike at bay, Wouter playing a Suchi, and uh, he's gonna flip on the Suchi, it seems. There he goes. Let's see if it's a hit. And yep, yeah, it's a hit. So Suchi is a goner. And things are really looking good for Bjorn here. I mean, he can now just attack if he wants to for seven. Actually, he can attack with his, uh, exactly with his Mistress Factories too. He can deal a lot of damage. Maybe he can possibly win the game. So seven, nine, 11 damage. And then he has a three damage from the trike. It's just not enough though to win. So we see Wouter is now at four and then he has to probably pass turn here or can he finish it? Okay, he's gonna use his Demonic Tutor and that's it because he can look up possibly another trike and kill him because he's still at six mana open and use the counters to kill Wouter here. So first game is for Bjorn and uh, I have to say Bjorn's deck is looking mighty powerful. So uh, both players are now going to uh, go into their sideboards and uh, we'll catch back up with them in game uh, number two. Game number two, Bjorn versus Wouter. Wouter now on the play after losing that first game and starting with a library of Alexandria. Okay, that's pretty decent. And Bjorn starting with the Soul Ring and now Wouter can start drawing some extra cards. Eight in hand at the moment, probably gonna play out a mountain and go. Okay, that's a Mistress Factory and go. And uh, both players again showing how many cards they have in hand with those dice there. And uh, there we see a Sage of Letnam and a Demonic Tutor for Bjorn. I wonder what he's going to look up. Probably something to get rid of that Loa. Because, you know, your opponent having a, a Library of Alexandria that's just uh, asking for trouble. He really needs to get uh, rid of that first. And a passing turn here while he's shuffling up. And there we see Wouter playing a basic mountain. And there is a Shatter on the Soul Ring. And that's a nice move. Also because the Sage of Latinum still has Summoning Sickness. So uh, Bjorn could not use it in response. And look at that. Bjorn just passing turn here. Not playing out anything. That's kind of a surprise to me. There's a Black Vice from Wouter, and Wouter's really taking more and more advantage of that Loa in every single turn. And of course, uh, that Loa works even better in a deck like Wouter's because it's just full of direct damage and gas. And there is a Suchi. He is taking damage from his own City of Brasses, but at least the Suchi will allow him to put some pressure on Wouter. And I kind of, I wonder what he looked up with his, um, with his Demonic Tutor. I was expecting um, perhaps a Chaos Orb that he would go and flip on the Library of Alexandria, but perhaps he had a different line of play. And Bauter here playing out another land. And there's an Atok. So the first one of this match, and he's passing turn. So Bjorn still having only four cards in hand, so no damage from the vice. Playing a Mox. Tapping two. There is a copy artifact. Probably copying the Suchi here. Eating the Suchi with the Sage, having four mana floating. There is a Mind Twist. Ooh, that is pretty brutal. Nice to see this, this uh, play, by the way, how Bjorn is using the mana from the Suchi. So sacking it to the Sage, using the mana from the Suchi. And a look at that, Wouter losing all the cards from, from his hand or, yeah, all the cards from his hand basically. And this is a great way, of course, to uh, to get the Library of Alexandria offline. So I guess that's the card that Bjorn looked up with his Demonic Tutor, well played here. And uh, Wouter now playing a Suchi. And all of a sudden Bjorn is completely back into this match after deactivating that Library of Alexandria. Tapping four here, there is an Icy Manipulator. That's not too bad. He can use it to take out one of the creatures of Wouter. And Bjorn now on 11, by the way. Wouter is on 20. All of a sudden, Wouter only one card in hand. And there is a tap down by Bjorn. Tapping the Suchi down, just taking a damage from, from his own city though, going down to 10. And I wonder if Wouter is going to attack here. 
And ooh, playing a detonate. That is pretty sweet. A detonate. The thing is with detonate, oh, of course, Bjorn can eat it. What I wanted to say, detonate not only destroys the artifact, but the opponent also gets damage equal to the casting cost. Now, the nice thing here for Bjorn is that he's got the Sage of Latinam, so he can actually eat his own artifact before he gets the damage from the detonate. So then the detonate fizzles. And this is really important for Bjorn. And uh, Bjorn also playing the Abyss here that takes care of the Atok. And now he probably has to use his City of Brassland for his Icy to tap down the Suchi. And attacking now with uh, the uh, Mishra's Factory. And look at that, a chump block from the Sage. He's now on eight, playing another Icy Manipulator. The problem here, of course, for Bjorn is that those Icy's are now costing him life as well because of that City of Brass. And this is interesting. He is playing out another Atok, and that's kind of surprising to me because of that Abyss that's on the, on the board. Maybe a little mistake by Wouter, I'm not sure, because now he's got to sack it, right, to the Abyss, or am I missing something? Yeah, exactly, so that, that, that Atok it made no sense in my book, but maybe I'm missing something. I'm not in the semifinal here. And that Suchi is getting tapped down, of course. And now Bjorn is slowly taking back control. The problem for Bjorn is though, he's on six. So if Wouter can find some direct damage, it's game over. There we see a copy artifact. Is he gonna copy the IC for even more control? I think he is. He just wants to tap everything down on the side of Wouter. He wants to tap down the Suchi and both of the Mishra's factories. I think if you're Wouter, you just have to wait now for, for your direct damage. Finding another Mishra's factory. And tapping down a Mishra's Factory and a Suchi, and then taking on his turn, finding an Underground Sea. What else can he do here? I mean, Bjorn is now in control. The problem is he's not dealing any damage to Wouter, and Wouter is just going to draw cards until he finds his direct damage spell. Perhaps Bjorn right now has a Mana Drain in hand, kind of waiting for the direct damage spell to happen. That could definitely be a scenario as well. There is a fireball from the side of Bjorn, casting it on the Suchi. That is interesting because he has so many ICs. On the other hand, there are th uh, three factories and one Suchi and only three ICs. So I guess it makes sense. Playing another copy, full play set of IC manipulators on the board right now. Oh man. I mean, one Icy is tough to play again uh, against, let alone four of them. But like I said, things haven't really changed for Wouter. He just needs to get that X spell and, and, and burn. And just stay alive. So he's animating all of his factories, kind of forcing Bjorn to respond. And this is interesting. There is a Chain Lightning and another Chain Lightning. Okay, that, that's it. So he's winning it on, um, on the direct damage. And that's kind of something that I already thought would happen. Bjorn did a really good job kind of getting back, you know, because he was, he was pretty far behind uh, with that uh, Mind Twist play and, you know, then getting, getting the ICs out, getting control back. But he was already so low. And you know against the Mono Red player, if you're so low, if you're on six, it's going to be really tough. Okay, well, that means it's 1-1. One, one, and uh, we're going to go to game number three. Game number three, the decider. Whoever's going to win this game is going to advance to the finals. And it's Bjorn on the play. Look at that Library of Alexandria for Bjorn here. Wow. That is a good start for him. Let's see what Wouter can do. Of course, he started in game number two with a library. There we see a nice answer. I, Wouter, I like it, man. Starting with the vice, putting Bjorn in a difficult spot. Is he gonna take tons of damage or is he going off the Loa plan? And I guess it's the second option. He's going off the Loa plan, playing a Triskelion with that Black Lotus and that Mishra's Workshop. I think it's a good decision because there's just so much damage in Wouter's deck. You don't wanna take extra damage from the vice you probably cannot afford to. And Bauter, you're playing a Mishra's Factory and a Shatter on the Triskelion. Triskelion, of course, in response, dealing three damage to Bauter. Bauter going down to 17. This is an interesting start already of this third and decisive game. There we see a Mishra's Factory followed up by a Suchi by Bjorn. 
So both players doing quite a lot in their first couple of turns. We see Valtteri playing a basic mountain, tapping two, not for an ATOC. I thought maybe there's an ATOC. And here you see him trying to tap the Felwer Stone. That doesn't work though, because Bjorn has only colorless mana sources. And then the Felwer Stone doesn't work. Felwer Stone could, can be great, especially in, uh, in a format with so many City of Brasses. But in this case, it's not working. And there we see a Mana Vault by Wouter. And he's passing turn here to Bjorn. There's that City of Brass I talked about. So now, now the Felwer Stone can make any color of mana. There's the attack from the Suchi. So probably Wouter's going to drop to 13 here. Exactly. Dropping to 13. Nothing to block with. And tapping six, there's the Tetravis. And I have to say, it must be kind of nice if your Bjorn has so many creatures in hand and so many powerful cards. He's got Tetravises, he's got Suchi Strikes, he's got Mishra's Workshops. And okay, here we see a Suchi from Wouter and we see the Atok. Maybe this will be the game that the, where the Atok will actually shine. We haven't really seen the Atok play a big role in the previous two games. And I expected more from the Atok, to be honest. And uh, let's see what Bjorn can do. Probably going to attack through the sky first, dealing four damage. Exactly, because he's ahead on life here. So you, Wouter is going to drop to nine, I believe. Yeah, 13, going to go to nine. Yeah, he's on nine. And there we see a time walk. Ooh, Wouter playing Red Elemental Blast. That is really a decisive play here from Wouter. I feel, because, uh, you know, Bjorn could have attacked, could have had a complete extra turn. Could have at least deal four more damage and then Wouter would drop to five and that's really, really low. And right now, what what is Bjorn going to do? Only two cards in hand, I believe, for Bjorn. No cards in hand for Wouter. And Wouter drawing one, putting it aside so it doesn't seem to be a very powerful one. Animating the factory. I think he's going to swing in here. Why not? So swinging in with everything. And remember, he has that ATOC. So, for example, if Bjorn says, you know what, I'm going to block your Mishra's factory, Wouter's just going to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to sack the factory, um, you know, to the ATOC. Or maybe Wouter has a burn spell in hand, like a bolt, and he can then just uh, bolt the Suchi. That's another option. But, you know, depending on the blocks, Wouter can decide what to do here. And this is one of the reasons why the ATOC is such a strong card, right? Because Bjorn can say, you know what, I'm just going to let the ATOC come through. But look at the amount of artifacts that Wouter has. He can he can sack his Vice, his Mana Vault, and his Felwer Stone to the ATOC. And then only with the ATOC, he can already deal 7 damage. The good thing here for Bjorn is that at least he's still on 15. He's pretty high up. And Wouter, of course, being kind of low, you know, this is, this is also Wouter a little bit in desperation mode, I feel. I wonder what he's going to block with his Suchi. It's always hard to see. I think he's going to block his Atok, so he's going to sack two artifacts. Suchi is going to die, and he's going to take six from the assembly worker and the Suchi. So he's dropping to nine. Bjorn taking his turn, and he can now attack back for six. Going to put him on two. The question is, is that wise? Probably not. Ooh, steel artifact. Ah, oh, it's so cool to see this card. A steel artifact. I love it, man. And he's, of course, in response, Wouter is going to eat the Suchi to the Atok. But how cool to see a Steel Artifact in a semi-final match. Really nice. And it did its job. It took care of one of the artifacts. And there we see another Suchi by Wouter. This is really an exciting third game. Remember, the winner will go on to the finals, and it's so close. Both players on eight. There we see an attack by the Atok. I mean, if you're Bjorn, you don't want to block, but you have to block, right? No, you don't have to because you're on eight. So if I'm not mistaken, because what Wouter can do, he can sack the Suchi, the Felwer Stone, and possibly turn his Mishra's Factory into an Assembly Worker. So he can sack three artifacts, and then the Atok turns into a six, uh, no, to a seven, eight, getting plus six, plus six. And that means that Bjorn will have one life left. Wow. What is Bjorn going to do? I mean, he doesn't want to block with the Tetravis because next turn... Oh, oh, he is blocking. Okay, I, I won't say he doesn't want to block his next turn. He want to take off the little Tetravites and he, he'll have three uh, or four 1-1 one -one blockers for that to Atok. Playing a Sage of Latinam. And in this game, we can really see the power of Atok. Atok is such an annoying card to deal with. And Bauter here attacking with both. 
That means that Bjorn will have to... Well, I mean, again, he's still on 8. I wonder what he's going to do. The Sage still has Summoning Sickness, so I think you don't really, really want to block on the Sage. What he can possibly do is use his Mishra's Factory, and the Mishra's Factory can then be turned into an Assembly Worker, pump itself to 3-3, block the Atok. I think that's what he's going to do, making it into a 2-2. Two -two. Blocking the Atok, made it into a 3-3, three -three, kind of saying to Walter, you know, if you want the Atok to live, you got to eat up your own Suchi. I wonder if he's going to do that. This is a hard decision to make. Bouter deciding not to. And playing a lightning bolt. Is it over? Oh, double bolt. Ah, man. And I have to say the fact that Bouter had double bolt um, shows that it was a good decision from Bjorn to block earlier in the game with the Tetravis because if he wouldn't have done that, he would already be dead. So, I mean, yes, he had some extra life to spare, but again, you're playing against a red player. You have to think about chain lightnings, lightning bolts, and of course, disintegrates, fireballs, whatever. In this deck, also trikes. So, it is really difficult uh, to play against these decks. You know, although they don't have power, there's so much gas, and I'm not surprised to see this deck advance to the finals. I mean, that being said, it is really an achievement, Wouter, that you've reached the finals with an underpowered deck. Uh, thank you guys for this match. This was a thriller, an absolute thriller. That game three, man. Oh, I love it. I love it. This is why I love old school magic, and this is why I love tournament magic from time to time as well. So, uh, well, thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. And if you like what you see, and if you want to support the channel, leave a like, leave a comment, tell me what you think of this game. Um, and also subscribe if you're not a sub yet. And if you want to, you can also share this video on your socials. All that really helps the channel grow and shows YouTube that you care for the content that I make. Another thing that you can do is you can become a patron on Patreon and then you can support the channel also financially. The nice thing is if you do, it already starts with a dollar. You can join our Discord. You can join the Timmy Talks events. Um, I will send you a Timmy Talks pin with the, with the logo of the channel. And the cool thing is um, your name. Your name will come into the end scroll after every video. How cool is that? Talking about the end scroll, let's take a look at the fantastic and amazing wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Let's go to the end scroll. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazink!